Okay, so thanks um, for sticking around on the last talk. Um, let me get my stuff over there. Okay. So thanks for inviting me to speak at the meetup. Um, I've been working for some time on bringing uh, scientific visualization to the browser, and I'm excited to share with you what I've been up to for the past couple of years and uh, to learn from all the great talks and from you, hopefully after, if we have some time to chat. Um, so I'm Will Usher. I work at Luminary Cloud. Uh, let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay. So, you know, it's mostly a game developer conference associated things. So I thought I'd give a little background on what scientific visualization is. I assume most people are you know, maybe not that familiar, may have some ideas. So at, at a very like rough level, um, in Cybiz, we work on rendering and computational techniques for analysis fields. So we have like engineering, we might have an airplane landing, uh, we're simulating like the noise and turbulence, we're interested in making this quieter, more efficient, more comfortable. We might be simulating power plants, studying how combustion is occurring, and um, you know, so we have like various uh, AMR and 3D volumes, all this stuff. Um, you know, these data sets can be hundreds of gigabytes in size, and we want to look at it interactively. Um, we could be looking at earth sciences. We might be studying earthquakes um, in Japan, uh, currents of the ocean, asteroids impacting the ocean outside of Seattle, uh, which hopefully we don't actually have in reality. Um, you know, chemistry, maybe new batteries, electronic systems, materials. Um, or you know, in medicine, we might have uh, MRI scans, kind of more routine things now, or brain tractographies, uh, brain reconstruction, um, you know, anything medical where they're scanning you, you can imagine you might see um, some volume rendering there now. Um, or, you know, going into space, we might be looking at astrophysics, studying things like the universe, how it forms, how the galaxy is expanding, how we can land rovers on Mars without crashing into the planet. Um, these are kind of the mix of things that we work on. Um, so as like a very... I would call it like a rough rule, like very coarse rule. If you see like image online, it's like, is that Cybiz? You can think, you know, my rules of thumb is like, is there a real world like 3D object? So like Facebook friend networks, you know, that's what we call like information visualization. There's not really like a, a 3D physical thing that we're talking about. Um, or, you know, is like a STEM field, just a domain. So like engineering, physics, that kind of stuff. Um, the field is really exciting for me because it, I'm kind of like a graphics person, and the challenges that we work with cut across a lot of uh, really fun topics for me. So computer graphics, ray tracing, acceleration structures, how do we render this real time interactively for you? Uh, the data is often tens to hundreds, gigabytes to terabytes or petabytes. How do we even access that efficiently to show you on a single computer, stream it to you, distribute it across a cluster? Um, this often needs some form of GPU, CPU, parallel computing, distributed computing, right, to process this large data. Um, as we try to help you understand the data more, we might be doing computational topology, clustering, machine learning. We want to make it possible for you to get insights about the data faster without having to, like, hunt in this data set for hours. So we try to do something to guide you. And uh, in, in the end, we have, like, an engineer or scientist who needs to understand the data. So... We also have aspects of like human computer interaction, perception, how do we present images to you, color the images based on the field so that you're going to understand what's going on and be able to interpret your data. Um, and what I was starting to learn, you know, a couple of years ago, which is not like news to anyone here, right, but that um, the browser is a really powerful and accessible platform for applications now, and specifically for me, uh, engineering applications. So with WebGL, WebGP, <clears throat> And WebAssembly, you know, we can do a lot. Um, there's no barrier to access for users. You can just put up a website. And, you know, if we really have, like, large data sets, we can push heavy compute onto the server, and we can send reduced data, you know, to the client in some uh, streaming fashion. So I'll go through quickly some experiences that I've had bringing Cybis to the web, um, and then later, you know, some interesting problems that I'm thinking about that, you know, maybe we can chat about after. You guys might have some ideas how to deal with some of these issues that I have. So um, a classic example that I always show people is marching cubes. Um, and in this example, we'll see like we can go from JavaScript to WebAssembly to WebGPU and eventually get it 43 times faster than we have a serial version. So uh, what is marching cubes, right? We might have a scan of some data 
So here we have a bonsai tree. It's a 3D grid volume. There's values defined at the vertices of this grid about essentially, for this case, like the density of the tree. And we want to produce a triangle surface of this data set. Um, you know, you may be familiar with the algorithm. Uh, it's almost embarrassingly parallel. There's basically a couple of parallel loops plus, you know, some prefix sum, stream compaction. So you're not quite, you know, just doing a for each, right? But basically we have a grid of values and we can classify each cell uh, what the triangulation should be based on the values at those vertices. We can do that in parallel, compute some offsets, and eventually output a triangle mesh. So, let's see. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, on my laptop, it's an M2 Max. I have a version in JavaScript that's serial. Um, you know, it takes about 520 to 800 milliseconds per surface. Pretty you know, poor experience. If I switch to WebAssembly, this was like a serial Rust version I wrote some time ago. Yeah, you know, like 2.8 times faster, 180 milliseconds. Okay. Um, I have a web GPU version, which is just like a naive data parallel one, doing like parallel, you know, uh, for stream compaction, stuff like that. Um, I'll run that through again. But, um, you know, eventually that's uh, about 12 milliseconds per surface. So, like, that's, you know, really nice as a user. Uh, what if my data is bigger? So, this is a 3D texture. Um, we basically assume that it's going to fit on the GPU. If it's too big, I, I kind of you know have problems. So we need to do something more. Uh, we need to do some kind of compression, maybe break up the data. So you know the data is often too big to send to the client. You know raw data. Um, so in this other project, we can basically break the data into bricks, compress those bricks, and decompress them on demand on the GPU. Um, we'll talk about like two example data sets here. We have the chameleon. This is a scan of a chameleon. It's you know, 1K by 1K by 1080 volume, 2.1 gigabytes, uh, kind of too big to send to someone uh, over the network. And uh, the Miranda is 1K cubed. It's a you know mixing fluid simulation. It's uh, 4.3 gigabytes. Um, you know, we're exceeding usually the, the memory that we're allowed in the browser tab at that point. And uh, it's not gonna fit on your GPU for what we can do in, in WebGL. So if we really think about the problem though, if we decompose the data set, you know, what is the data working set that we need for marching cubes, right? It's really just uh, these, these blocks that I've highlighted in blue to compute this orange surface. Um, and this is usually uh, through the nature of how ISO surfaces are defined, very sparse, right? So uh, if we actually do this, we break up the data, compress it, decompress on the fly and cache these bricks that we need, um, we can achieve the, a pretty substantial reduction in the working set that we need to compute these surfaces, right? So the chameleon compresses down to about 283 megabytes. Um, this is using CFP. The cache size for computing this uh, surface is 227 megabytes. So like a 4.1x reduction. Um, you can run this in real time um, on your laptop. I can link you to the GitHub repo uh, after if you want to try it out. Uh, ZFP is, um, actually, I forget what it stands for. But um, it's a floating point compression library from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory for like com compressing scientific data sets. Um, it's, yeah, it's specifically optimized for these kind of grid simulations where there's a lot of spatial coherence in the data. Um, I think ZFP, it probably just stands for zip floating point, uh, knowing, <laughs> knowing the author. Um, so, and, you know, the Miranda that com you know, compresses down to 537 megabytes. Uh, we need about 1.1 gigabytes of cache here, which is quite a lot, uh, the, there's a lot of blocks that are active, right, that the surface crosses because of the structure of the surface. But we still get a uh, 2.7x reduction here. Um, the last thing I'll wrap up with is basically what I'm doing at Luminary Cloud today. So we're shipping a single source Cybiz rendering library in production. Um, our requirements are that obviously we need high performance on large data. We want to run on the web and on the backend server because we'll have an API for rendering images. So we need to both run a native build and a web build. Uh, we need to support you know, CAD mesh and simulation because of our application. People bring in CAD, they will mesh it, they will run a simulation and they want to view those results. Uh, so you know, what we're shipping, we have C++ code. We compile it to WebAssembly with Emscripten for the web. Uh, we're using WebGL2 still. We're waiting for wider WebGPU support right now, uh, hopefully soon. 
Um, we do a lot of batching and programmable pulling to reduce CPU draw overhead. So actually the Wonderland engine talk is a good segue. Our stuff is definitely not as fancy because our uh, things that we're rendering are more constrained. We're not a game engine, so we're, we're very, our, our inputs are more fixed. Um, we also use TBB for multi-threading in WebAssembly and native build. So we ship uh, shared array buffer multi-threading within Scripton. Um, an interesting thing that you know we could talk about later, we actually expose a C API for how we couple with JavaScript and React. Um, and we have a native backend as well. Um, yeah, so these are some nice images produced in our application. Um, and I'm not really an aerodynamics person, so I've run this cow through the application um, to study uh, bovine aerodynamics. Um, another thing that we're starting to look at is that, you know, the, if you think a lot of people in data science, sciences use Jupyter Lab. The front end for Jupyter is just the web browser. So like we can run WebAssembly, WebGL, WebGPU, all this stuff in Jupyter. Um, so that's really exciting. And I'll wrap up uh, quickly with some problems that I'm thinking about since um, these are kind of things that I hope maybe you have some ideas and um, can give me some cool pointers. So if we look at the mesh tessellation for simulation meshes, from a graphics person perspective, the meshes are insane for rendering. They're like super over tessellated. This is a coarse airplane and it's refined like this for the simulation but from a graphics perspective you know if an artist gave you this you'd be like what are you giving me right and so if i simplify it with mesh optimizer i could probably simplify it more right we know what to do right high visual detail on a simple mesh texture mapping right uv unwrap it uh render a field map simplify the surface put the field map on it and you know looks great right so i've got the piper colored by the pressure field Render the field map uh, works well. But these meshes can be really big. Time is a constraint. Some of these um, surfaces that we deal with are, are transient. Somebody runs something that produces a surface output, and we're kind of constrained how fast we do that. Uh, holes in the map also mean I can't simplify the mesh. I start seeing holes show up. Not great. Um, and the other case is that uh, I might actually have a ton of geometric detail that I do need to preserve. So this is a Q criterion isosurface of a car. It shows a lot of turbulence. It's great for marketing. People love to look at this, especially animated over time. It's very cool. But it's 144 million triangles. I can't really send this to you plus all the field data on the browser. Uh, if I simplify it with Mesh Optimizer 50% to 72 million triangles, it's still uh, too big, right? I can't really play this over time. If I go further, you know, let it simplify more down to 10%. Uh, at this point, I don't want to send it to you because it's garbage, right? I can't <laughs> use this. Um, so yeah, it's meetup. Let's chat. You know, fast UV unwrapping, progressive mesh simplification, uh, compression, uh, data parallel algorithms or libraries for web GPU, web GL, web GPU, web assembly, Jupyter integrations, debugging, profiling, <clears throat> whatever you got. Uh, I'm interested. Well, let's talk about it. Um, these are my colleagues that I've worked with on these different projects. Um, you can find me on these different links and uh, afterwards, and this is my file. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> And then possibly because there was loosely building the link there with Aaron stuff. I'm curious uh, uh, what was again I help your security needs? It seems like it um yeah. so it doesn't change the amount of data we can transfer necessarily, but in terms of what you're trying to do, not not mm -hmm. over random stuff, it's gonna be a sub pixel or a pixel level. 
Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I know about nanite. I haven't looked too much into it. So I don't You might have looked more into nanite. I don't want to come up and answer it. I mean, like, I've, I've thought, like, okay, nanite is good, like, progressive geometry streaming. You know, that's kind of what you want here. Like, as you're zooming in, you can get more refinement. As you zoom out, you see less. Um, I'm not as familiar with like you maybe what's the build time cost for like constructing something for nanite like we can run that on the server um and then stream it to people um you know the kind of issues we would have is that like these are surfaces are kind of temporary in some sense like if i have a bunch of time steps and i want to play through them the cost to like prepare the geometry is going to be delayed for the user to see that um and so that's like one of the issues we have with like um, build time for these kind of data structures and then um i don't know if you Want to answer about like rendering nanite? Yeah. Uh, so I think I'm sure I can do that, but I didn't want to go back and see the recording. We um, had a bunch of nanite during the kind of optimization slides. We had a demo running on 60 FPS on a request on a web scale too. We don't need web scale. Okay. Well, so like a mega yeah. kernel. Uh, it, we call it mesh led emulation, where we're using the mesh optimizer has amazing ability to kind of generate the mesh lets. It gets a little bit tough with this kind of thing because you need LODs for, for these kind of mesh lets because you want to have kind of like far away things that reduce a bit. Uh, so I think for this, it would be extremely tough to use uh -huh. something like that. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if there's any more, we can just wrap up and head back.